So this is lesson A for EMS 260, the trauma care course. We're going to talk about these things, discuss bleeding, hypovolemic shock, talk about managing injuries, and then talk about patients who have fallen. Bleeding can be described as either internal or external. There's different management techniques for both. Internal bleeding is almost always going to have to be handled in a surgical setting. Whereas external bleeding control should be something we can accomplish in the field with direct pressure and moving rapidly to a tourniquet if needed. Nothing wrong with pressure points, nothing wrong with elevation, the age-old techniques that we used prior to uh, tourniquets being uh, more emphasized recently than in the deep past. So there's nothing wrong with pressure points as long as it doesn't distract you from moving on to applying a tourniquet. Nothing wrong with elevation when possible. Um, you can use those as adjuncts, but the, the basic plan is direct pressure, real direct pressure, aggressive direct pressure, and then uh, pretty quickly moving to a tourniquet. Tourniquet tightened until the blood flow to the extremity stops. We need to stop the pulse, stop the inbound blood. We don't want to allow arterial blood to come in, but venous flow to be obstructed, so we want uh, tight tourniquets that stop pulses. Bleeding can be talked about as being arterial, venous, or capillary. Certainly the arterial uh, source would be much higher in volume and higher in pressure, harder to control. And again, control of external bleeding really focuses on direct pressure, followed by um, quickly, promptly moving to the use of a tourniquet. Internal bleeding mostly done in the hospital in a surgical setting. We can do some things in the field uh, for fracture care uh, to do some splinting and limit some movement that may slow down and, or temporarily assist in uh, managing internal bleeding. So we want you to continue to remember that internal bleeding is something to be concerned about and there are some things we can do in terms of managing fractures um, in the field. <clears throat> and then is your patient in hypovolemic shock? So we're gonna talk about hypovolemic shock here for just a second. Um, typically we talk about several symptoms, signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. Altered mental status would be the first, the first two um, to occur uh, with decreased blood flow to the brain, some anxiety, restlessness, fear, that sort of thing. But those also can be attributed to lots of other things. So it's subtle in many cases. It's uh, not specific, um, but cer certainly something to um, keep in mind and remember. Another key point here is that a patient's blood pressure does not have to drop. They do not have to be hypotensive for us to consider that they're in shock. Shock and hypotension are not the same thing. Uh, compensation mechanisms will kick in and hopefully um, compensate and keep the blood pressure from dropping uh, while the patient is in shock. Then once we do have hypotension, then we have moved on to decompensated shock. And that again is where the blood pressure comes in. So if we were to ask you uh, and give you a scenario of a patient with certain vital signs, the thing you don't need to know is the blood pressure to tell us whether that patient is in shock or not. The blood pressure has nothing to do with it. The blood pressure would be used to, to determine if they are still compensating or if their uh, blood loss, their volume loss has overwhelmed their body's ability to compensate and therefore they have some hypotension. Patients will usually be tachycardic unless a reason why not, uh, particularly with hypovolemic shock. And we don't have the strange presentation that you would have with neurogenic shock but with hypovolemic shock, the heart rate should increase unless there's something keeping that heart rate low, such as a beta blocker that, that works in, in essence as a governor on their engine, keeps their uh, heart rate from tacking up past a certain point. We'd also expect to see cool, pale, clammy skin unless there's some reason um, why that would not be the case in some weird presentation. But typically, the skin will get cool because there's not enough warm blood going by. The skin will get pale, there's not enough red blood going by, and then you get uh, moisture and diaphoresis and such. So if a person has lost volume, one of our tactics is to replace the volume. Now we would like to stop the volume loss first. So with external bleeding, one of the first things we want to focus on is stopping any further volume from being lost. But with internal bleeding, a lot of times in the field setting, there's nothing we can really do to uh, definitively deal with the ongoing loss. And so we're basically playing catch up and trying to um, replace that lost volume. Ideally, we would have blood 
In most cases, we won't have that as an option, so we make do with a poor backup choice with crystalloids. Uh, normal saline or lactated ringers, pretty much equivalent, uh, at least at this point. There may be some movement in the future back toward uh, lactated ringers based on some of the issues with uh, saline. We call it abnormal saline, as you know. Uh, the pH is much lower. And um, so we want to be careful with overdoing it on volume. We don't want to be flooding the patient with fluid if they have pulmonary edema. We want to continue to check for signs of CHF, particularly pulmonary edema. So those lung sounds are very important. We want to give our fluids in boluses of 250 cc increments. So wide open until you've given 250. So then slow it down, recheck pressure, recheck all vitals, recheck lung sounds, and then open it up again for another 250 if needed. And just keep repeating that up until you've given about two liters. Um, and then you need to call and, and see if medical control in this particular case wants you to continue using crystalloids or if they want to uh, determine that that's probably been enough. And different judgments will occur in different situations and in different systems. So um, our protocol for our program is uh, 250 cc increments up to two liters and then, and then talk to somebody. Injury and fracture care kind of goes back to the basics. Uh, don't let this distract you from your overall patient management. These are BLS skills. You can outsource this, delegate this to uh, BLS providers. Um, but splinting is important. It reduces pain to some extent. It reduces internal bleeding to some extent. And we want to make sure we have the most appropriate splint. And then uh, most appropriate would be based on the patient's condition. If the patient is in severe hypovolemic shock, um, decompensated, they're already hypotensive, um, probably the, the most appropriate splint is whatever you can do fastest, most rapidly. In some cases, that's a, a long spine board. Um, secure them to the board as quickly as you can and get moving. And while that's not the ideal splint for anything, it may be most appropriate in that compromised patient. What if the um, injured extremity is deformed um, and is not in an easily splintable position, if that's a word. Um, and so you should splint it like it lies as long as it has decent distal circulation, motor function, and sensation. And compare side to side. People are, should be symmetrical. And so hoping that uh, the opposite extremity is not injured, you can compare it to the injured extremity and get an idea for what that person's distal circulation, motor function, and sensation would be. If it's compromised, then let's move it back toward a more anatomical position. If it's not, then let's leave it, splint it like it lies. And then people that suffer fractures and, and injuries will have pain and they may have nausea. And it may be most appropriate to control that prior to trying to move the patient. Again, it's all based on a judgment call on how sick they are at the time. But do not overlook pain and nausea control prior to moving. So all EMS systems run a bunch of patients who have fallen, and here's our big idea. Lots of things cause them to fall. Sometimes they just trip. Sometimes they have a cardiac arrhythmia and they pass out. So the cause of that fall may well be a bigger deal than the injuries. People will call us because they fell and they have injuries from that fall, and we need to dig deeper. Uh, and while we're managing the injuries, to dig deeper and work on figuring out what the cause of that fall is. Again, why do people fall? Sometimes they slip, they trip, sometimes they have compromised balance, they have compromised uh, stability with their feet or knees, um, and so they may just be a little unsteady to start with and it doesn't take much for them to fall and, and, uh, and it's simply they slipped or tripped. And that's probably the majority of the fall cases, but again, we're not in the business of dealing with just the majority. We need to think of everything every time. Maybe they had a syncopal episode. Maybe they simply fainted. Maybe there was a cardiac rhythm problem. Maybe it was a VTAC or um, extreme bradycardia, something where the rate became too slow or too fast for them to maintain blood pressure. And we need to check on that. Maybe they had something neurological, a stroke or a bleed or something. And so they call us for a fall and a hip fracture, but it turns out that there's a neurocrisis going on at the same time.
manage the injuries on these folks while you continue to look for the cause of the fall. Don't have it be one and then the other. Do these things concurrently. Most of this can be outsourced, delegated to your BLS providers. Stop the bleeding, deal with the wound, uh, keep it as clean as possible. In the case where it's grossly contaminated, it's reasonable to, to uh, rinse it and, as best you can. Um, and then let's do something with the bones that are broken. Um, stabilize those. That helps limit pain, helps slow uh, the internal bleeding. I don't think a splint's ever going to make it feel perfect, but um, it's, it's certainly something that we want to work on. We just want to make sure that we're working at the speed that we should be. We don't have to go extremely fast on every patient, but on some patients we need to go extremely fast. And then consider that volume loss um, from that injury. General splinting, if it's above the waist in an arm or shoulder, um, some sort of rigid splint, whether that be a vacuum splint or something that you make out of SAM splints or board splints or other things, and then you probably can add a sling and swath in most cases and make it be an appropriate splint. So a rigid splint plus a sling and swath above the waist, and then below the waist you have the rigid splint, and then a scoop or a backboard or something, at least to move them to the cart. And there's a lot of sensitivity about leaving people on backboards, and we, we get that. Um, but the backboard or scoop stretcher remains a legitimate tool to at least move a patient to the ambulance cart, um, if not continue to splint them with that. Of all the fall patients that we run, hip fractures are very, very common, uh, and these just hurt. And there's not a heck of a lot that we can do to stop that pain. We can try to do some pain control prior to moving. In most cases, these Patients will have put themselves in their position of least discomfort before you get there. And so they may not appear to be in a great deal of pain, but as soon as we move them, then the pain really spikes. And so we need to consider pain and nausea control before we move the patient. And this means we have to be uh, pretty efficient uh, and move, move relatively uh, promptly to get that IV, get the pain medicine, get the nausea control medicine in, and let it start to work. The fact that you've just given someone some fentanyl for pain control doesn't mean you can then move them 20 seconds later. It's going to take a little bit. And so during that time is when you can do some further investigation on the cause of the fall and really get into a, a more detailed exam and detailed history and physical. Scooper spine board's okay. Remember, it, it matters how long they're going to be on the board overall, so let that enter into your uh, judgment. Uh, maybe it makes more sense just to get a bunch of folks and directly lift them to the cart. Maybe you can use a sheet or a blanket as an option. So these are judgment call situations. What's pretty clear is that traction splints have almost no role ever in a hip fracture and a pretty limited role in general in the field, a traction splint requires an intact pelvis. And I just don't understand how you can tell if a patient's pelvis is fractured or not with your x-ray eyes in the field. So traction splints have been something brought up by students in the past and we just don't understand that. They just don't have a role here. <clears throat> Talked earlier about hypovolemia. Want to bring up something to also consider that the blood loss from a fracture occurs over time. And so if your patient just fell and you had a short, a short response time, then there hasn't been a lot of blood loss from that fracture yet. However, if your patient's been down for several minutes or hours, then the blood loss becomes a bigger deal. Dehydration, uh, glucose levels can drop. Uh, we can have something called rhabdomyolysis, which is in essence, um, breakdown of muscle, um, releasing some potassium uh, into the bloodstream, which causes arrhythmias and all kinds of issues. And so long downtime is a big deal, and you should uh, consider it and at least investigate it and be aware of it. Also think about their meds. A lot of these folks that fall are older, and older folks tend to be taking more medications. And the, the two that really stand out are beta blockers and blood thinners. So beta blockers will kind of govern their heart rate, will kind of keep their heart rate from increasing. So a patient not on beta blockers and hypovolemic shock, you would expect to see a heart rate in the 120s, 130s, 140s. But a patient on beta blockers is not going to get over 100 in many cases. And so consider that, um, that those beta blockers may be, and calcium blockers can do the same thing, uh, 
but think about the beta blockers as, as you're assessing vitals and determining if your patient is, is shocky or not or needs, needs treatment. And then blood thinners, obviously, are clot preventers is what would be a better um, word for that, better phrase for that. And so on a normal basis, a patient takes um, a blood thinner to prevent clots from forming to cause a heart attack or stroke. And that's great up until they have trauma and then they need clots to form in order to stop bleeding. So you know, these meds work for them until they're in trauma, then they work against them to some extent. Then consider the size of the bone, number of bones. Uh, femur is a large bone, pelvis are, is a large bone, lots of uh, possible bleeding there. And then what if a patient has fallen and has more than one um, injured bone? So a humerus, um, a pelvis, um, a femur, something like that. And when you add up the, the blood loss, it can be significant. And then when you add some extended downtime to that, it can be very significant. And so we want you to consider all that, and we will test you on uh, scenarios and simulation cases involving that going forward. Um, again, remember that a patient is in shock based on whether they have signs of shock and uh, whether they're hypotensive or not has nothing to do with it. That just tells us whether they are in compensated or uncompensated shock. And blood loss is best replaced with blood, and our poor backup plan is to use crystalloids. Spinal motion restriction, well, what you have is national testing standards in conflict with local protocol in many places. Remember that um, we are in a training program to address where you might work anywhere and, and where you might test on a national basis. And so if your service has very specific spinal motion restriction protocols, remember um, to step out of that mindset uh, when you're in a testing scenario. With any selective spinal motion restriction protocol that we've ever seen, uh, there's always discussion about distracting injuries and altered level of consciousness or altered mental status. So if your patient has an extremely painful hip fracture and you're trying to examine their neck or back to determine if you're going to do spinal motion restriction based on a pain response, it may be that that hip fracture is so painful that it's overwhelming their ability to sense any pain anywhere else. And that's if they're not altered. If they're altered, um, then it's even more so. And then again, remember the length of time your patient's on that backboard is a big deal. If you're coming um, an hour to the hospital, then um, you would be less likely to leave your patient on the backboard once they're moved to the ambulance cart. If you're five blocks down the street, you may well decide that the extra movement is not necessary. Judgment calls. We are paid for our judgment, not following uh, strict recipes without any ability to, uh, to make adjustments. <clears throat> then you need to look for the cause. So manage the injuries, get some pain control, nausea control when important or when appropriate. And then it's important to figure out what caused this. The cause of the fall may be a bigger deal than the fall itself. Was it a, a cardiac event? Was there some neuro thing going on? Uh, check their glucose. Look for all other possible uh, causes of this. And then fall prevention is something else we should talk about. And it's kind of like in the fire service where we're pretty much out of the fire suppression business because hardly any fires start anymore because fire prevention has moved to such a uh, significant piece of what we do in the fire service. And so fall prevention is what we should also look at. And you can do that on any call. You can check someone's house, you know, are, are things secure? Uh, do they have working smoke detectors, working CO detectors? Is the gas on the stove on, but yet the pilot lights out? all these things, and add fall prevention, slip and trip hazards to that. It's just the overall professional part of EMS. How do you run these calls? Well, as always, we have continuous safety assessment, maintain situational awareness at all times. Don't lose focus on circulation, ventilation, and oxygenation. CVO is the key. Then figure out what you need to do urgently. Probably some bleeding control, Probably keep the patient from moving around too much, although in most cases they will do that themselves. But deal with bleeding control if necessary. Find all the injuries. Decide if you're going to need to do manipulation or not, or if you can just splint it as it lies. Do the splinting, pain control. Deal with volume replacement. Consider your downtime. And don't forget to search for the cause and integrate all these things in into a good, smooth, efficient, and effective process 
flow for your patient. So as far as lab prep for 260, lab A, um, be sure you're up to speed on bleeding control and know what to do, how to manage a tourniquet, how tight to make it, know signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock and um, how you're going to do treatment there, particularly with your fluid boluses. Um, think about injury care in terms of appropriate splints and when to splint and how to splint and then um, the whole thing with the fall patients. That cause of the fall may be a big deal, so don't forget that. Um, so work on figuring that out while you're working on, um, on the injury management. Your first scenario is going to be an extremity injury. We'll give you a gunshot a stab or a big laceration. You'll have bleeding control to deal with, some wound care, and a little bit of musculoskeletal injury care to manage. Really not a difficult case lets you kind of get in the flow. So that's your first scenario. The second one, we're going to give you a simple fall because the patient tripped. They've got what looks like a hip fracture. Their leg is externally uh, rotated, shortened. It's very painful. Um, you'll need to get some vitals and history. Um, and that will tell you that there's really no big long downtime, no complicated meds or anything like that. Um, it would be most appropriate for you to do some pain and nausea control prior to moving. Um, and really the cause of this fall is probably that they just tripped. You should rule out the other stuff. So it becomes a little bit more detailed, but certainly a bread and butter, um, easy to manage call. Scenario three, a little bit harder, looks just like scenario two, only now we add a couple of meds in, we add a long downtime in, and um, we want you to, to be thinking about how to manage and, and deal with that patient. So that's pretty much where we're at here with uh, EMS 260 lesson A.